as often as she could. She cried, but the donkey was getting a little thin and tired looking. The mistress began to investigate. One day she peeked through a crack in the door and saw the animal's marvelous member and the delight of the girl stretched under the donkey. She said nothing. Later, she knocked on the door and called the maid out on an errand, a long and complicated errand. I won't go into details. The servant knew what was happening, so... Ah, my mistress, she thought to herself, you should not send away the expert. When you begin to work without full knowledge, you risk your life. Your shame keeps you from asking me about the board, but you must have that to join with this donkey. There's a trick you don't know. But the woman was too fascinated with her idea to consider any danger. She led the donkey in. I ate. And closed the door, thinking, with no one around I can shout in my pleasure. She was busy with anticipation, her vagina glowing and singing like a nightingale. She arranged the chair under the donkey, as she had seen the girl do. She raised her legs and pulled him into her. Her fire kindled more, and the donkey politely pushed as she urged him to, pushed through and into her intestines, and, without a word, she died. The chair fell one way, and she the other. The room was smeared with blood. Reader, have you ever seen anyone martyred for a donkey? Remember what the Quran says about the torment of disgracing yourself. Don't sacrifice your life to your animal soul. If you die of what that leads you to do, you are just like this woman on the floor. She is an image of a moderation. Remember her, and keep your balance. The maid servant returns and says, Yes, you saw my pleasure, but you didn't see the board that put a limit on it. You opened your shop before a master taught you the craft. 182. B-R-E-A-D-M-A-K-I-N-G. There was a feast. The king was heartily in his cups. He saw a learned scholar walking by. Bring him in and give him some of this fine wine. Servants rushed out and brought the man to the king's table, but he was not receptive. I had rather drink poison. I have never tasted wine and never will. Take it away from me. He kept on with these loud refusals disturbing the atmosphere of the feast. This is how it sometimes is at God's table. Someone who has feared about ecstatic love, but never tasted it, disrupts the banquet. If there were a secret passage from his ear to his throat, everything in him would change. Initiation would occur, as it is, he's all fire and no light, all husk and no kernel. The king gave orders, cupbearer, do what you must. This is how your invisible guide acts, the chess champion across from you that always wins. He cupped the scholar's head and said, taste, Z83, and, again, the cup was drained and the intellectual started singing and telling ridiculous jokes. He joined the garden, snapping his fingers and swaying. Soon, of course, he had to pee. He went out, and there, near the latrine, was a beautiful woman, one of the king's harem. His mouth hung open, he wanted her, right then, he wanted her, and she was not unwilling. They fell to, on the ground. You've seen a baker rolling dough. He kneads it gently at first, then more roughly. He pounds it on the board. It softly groans under his palms. 
Now he spreads it out and rolls it flat. Then he munches it, and rolls it all the way out again, thin. Now he adds water, and mixes it well. Now salt, and a little more salt. Now he shapes it delicately to its final shape and slides it into the oven, which is already hot. You remember bread making? This is how your desire tangles with a desired one. 184 And it's not just a metaphor for a man and a woman making love. Warriors in battle do this too. A great mutual embrace is always happening between the eternal and what dies, between essence and accident. The sport has different rules in every case, but it's basically the same. And remember, the way you make love is the way God will be with you. So these two were lost in their sexual trance. They did not care anymore about feasting or wine. Their eyes were closed like perfectly matching calligraphy lines. The king went looking for the scholar, and when he saw them their couple, commented, Well, as it is said, a good king must serve his subjects from his own table. There is joy, a wine-like freedom that dissolves the mind and restores the spirit, and there is manly fortitude like the king's, a reasonableness that accepts the bewildered lostness. But meditate now on steadfastness and clarity, and let those be the wings that lift and soar through the celestial spheres. Z85 Z7 I Solomon Poems Far Moss. On Solomon. Solomon and Sheba are types for the courtship story going on in all of Rumi's poetry. King Solomon, woman is divine wisdom, sends messengers to coax the Queen of Sheba, the bodily soul, to leave her kingdom and come live with him. She coyly sends envoys back with cruelty inappropriate gifts. And when she herself finally arrives, she does so with the one thing she cannot bear to leave, her filigree. Throne the body. The marriage of spiritual vision with the body finds many metaphors throughout Rumi's art. Jesus riding the lean donkey, the way a river dissolves into the ocean, dawn sunlight filling a ruby, the nights he contained in a person's eyes. The ecstatic astonishment within Rumi's poetry comes from his first-hand wonder at how the ocean comes to pour the drop. I once had a dream where I was supposed to give a lecture on Rumi and D. H. Lawrence, but I couldn't find the lecture hall. The challenge was to connect Lawrence's dark body knowledge with Rumi's spiritual enlightenment. I ended up in some anteroom meeting more nerves. The mind knows when it's been assigned work outside its purview. Yumi's poetry nourishes the part of us that wants a continually unfolding truth, not some confined conclusion. The relationship of soul wisdom and the body, Solomon and Shiva, is a dynamic dance that keeps generating stories. Sheba's gifts to Solomon. Queen Sheba loads 40 mules with gold bricks as gifts for Solomon. When her envoy and his party reach the wide plain leading to Solomon's palace. Z86. They see that the top layer of the entire plain is pure gold. They travel on gold for 40 days. What foolishness to take gold to Solomon, when the dirt of his land is gold? Who do you think to offer? Your intelligence, reconsider. The mind is less than road dust. The embarrassing commonness they bring only slows them down. They argue. They discuss turning back, but they continue, carrying out the orders of their queen. Solomon laughs when he sees them unloading gold bars. When have I asked 
you for a sock for my suit. I don't want gifts from you. I want you to be ready for the gifts I give. You worship a planet that creates gold. Worship instead the one who creates the universe. You worship the sun. The sun is only a cook. Think of a solar eclipse. What if you get attacked at midnight? Who will help you then? These astronomical matters fade. Another intimacy happens. A sun at midnight, with no lease, no night or day. The clearest intelligence is faint, seeing the solar system flickering, so tiny in that immense lightness. Drops fall into a vapor, and the vapor explodes into a galaxy. Half a ray strikes a patch of darkness. A new sun appears. One slight, alchemical gesture, and Saturnine qualities form inside the planet Saturn. Z87. The sensuous eye needs sunlight to see. Use another eye. Vision is luminous. Sight is igneous, and sun fire light very dark. Solomon to Shiva. Solomon says to the messengers from Shiva, I send you back as messengers to her. Tell her this refusal of her gift of gold is better than acceptance. Because with it she can learn what we value. She loves her throne, but actually it keeps her from passing through the doorway that leads to a true majesty. Tell her, one surrendering bow is sweeter than a hundred empires, is itself a kingdom. Be dizzy and wandering like Ibrahim, who suddenly left everything. In a narrow well things look backward from how they are. Stones and metal objects seem treasure, as broken pottery does to children pretending to be UI and sell. Tell her, Joseph sat in such a well, then reached to take the rope that rose to a new understanding. The alchemy of a changing life is the only truth. Shiva's hesitation. Lovers of God, sometimes a door opens, and a human being becomes a way for grace to come through. Z88 I see various herbs in the kitchen garden, each with its own bed, garlic, papers, saffron, and basil, each watered differently to help it mature. We keep the delicate ones separate from the turnips, but there's room for all in this unseen world, so vast that the Arabian desert gets lost in it like a single hair. In the ocean, imagine that you are Shiva trying to decide whether to go to Solomon. You're haggling about how much to pay. For shooing a donkey, when you could be seated with one who is always in union with God, who carries a beautiful garden inside himself. You could be moving in a circuit without wings, nourished without eating, sovereign without a throne. No longer subject to fortune, you could be luck itself. If you would rise from sleep, leave the market arguing, and learn that your own essence is your wealth. She is grown. When the Queen of Sheba came to Solomon, she left behind her kingdom and her wealth the same way lovers leave their reputations. Her servants meant nothing to her, less than a rotten onion. Her palaces and orchards, so many piles of dung. She heard the inner meaning of L.A. No, she came to Solomon with nothing, except her throne. As the writer's pen becomes a friend, as the tool the workman uses day after day becomes deeply familiar, so her filigree throne was her one attachment. Z89 I would explain more about this phenomenon, but it would take too long.
It was a large throne and difficult to transport, because it couldn't be taken apart, being as cunningly put together as the human body. Solomon saw that her heart was open to him and that this throne would soon be repulsive to her. Let her bring it, he said. It will become a lesson to her like the old shoes and jacket her tie is. She can look at that throne and see how far she's come. In the same way, God keeps the process of generation constantly before us. The smooth skin and the semen and the growing embryo. When you see a pearl on the bottom, you reach through the foam and broken sticks on the surface. When the sun comes up, you forget about locating the constellation of Scorpio. When you see the splendor of union, the attractions of duality seem poignant and lovely, but much less interesting. Solomon's crooked crown. Solomon was busy judging others, when it was his personal thoughts that were disrupting the community. His crown slid crooked on his head. He put it straight, but the crown went awry again. Eight times this happened. I-90. Finally he began to talk to his headpiece. Why do you keep tilting over my eyes? I have to. When your power loses compassion, I have to show what such a condition looks like. Immediately Solomon recognized the truth. He knelt and asked forgiveness. The crown centered itself on his crown. When something goes wrong, accuse yourself first. Even the wisdom of Plato or Solomon can wobble and go blind. Listen when your crown reminds you of what makes you pull toward others, as you pamper the greedy energy inside. The Far Mosque The place that Solomon made to worship in, called the Far Mosque, is not built of earth and water and stone, but of intention and wisdom and mystical conversation and compassionate action. Every part of it is intelligence and responsive to every other. The carpet bows to the broom. The door knocker and the door swing together like musicians. This heart sanctuary does exist, but it can't be described. Why try? Solomon goes there every morning and gives guidance with words, with musical harmonies, and in actions, which are the deepest teaching. A prince is just a conceit until he does something with generosity. 9. A bird delegation came to Solomon complaining, why is it you never criticize the nightingale? It was my way, the nightingale explained for Solomon, is different. Mid-March to mid-June I sing. The other nine months, while you continue chirping, I'm silent. 192. C8. For the free fish. Gamble everything for love. On gambling. To a frog that's never left his pond the ocean seems like a gamble. Look what he's giving up. Security, mastery of his world, recognition. The ocean frog just shakes his head. I can't really explain what it's like where I live, but someday I'll take you there. If you want what visible reality can give, you're an employee. If you want the unseen world, you're not living your truth. Both wishes are foolish, but you'll be forgiven for forgetting that what you really want is love's confusing joy. Gamble everything for love, if you're a true human being. If not, leave this gathering. Half-heartedness doesn't reach into majesty. You set out to find God, but then you keep. 193. Stopping for long periods of mean-spirited roadhouses. 
In a road down a fast running creek, it feels like trees on the bank are rushing by. What seems to be changing around us is rather the speed of our craft leaving this world. The Three Fish This is the story of the lake and the three big fish that were in it. One of them intelligent, another half intelligent, and the third, stupid. Some fishermen came to the edge of the lake with their nets. The three fish saw them. The intelligent fish decided at once to leave, to make the long, difficult trip to the ocean. He thought, I won't consult with these two on this. They will only weaken my resolve, because they love this place so. They call it home. Their ignorance will keep them near. When you're traveling, ask a traveler for advice, not someone whose lameness keeps him in one place. Muhammad says, Love of one's country, 194, is part of the faith. But don't take that literally. Your real country is where you're heading, not where you are. Don't misread the hadith. In the ritual of oceans, according to tradition, there's a separate prayer for each body part. When you snuff water up your nose to cleanse it, beg for the scent of the spirit. The proper prayer is, Lord, wash me. My hand has washed this part of me, but my hand can't wash my spirit. I can wash this skin, but you must wash me. A certain man used to say the wrong prayer for the wrong hole. He'd say the nose prayer when he splashed his behind. Can the odor of heaven come from our rumps? Don't be humble with fools. Don't take pride into the presence of a master. It's right to love your home place, but first ask, where is that really? The wise fish saw the men in their nets and said, I'm leaving. Ali was told a secret doctrine by Muhammad and told not to tell it, so he whispered it down the mouth of a well. Sometimes there's no one to talk to. You must just set out on your own. So the intelligent fish made its whole length of moving footprint and, like a deer the dog's chase, suffered greatly on its way, but finally made it to the endless safety of the sea. The half-intelligent fish thought, My guide has gone. I ought to have gone with him, but I didn't, and now I've lost my chance to escape. 195. I wish I'd gone with him. Don't regret what's happened. If it's in the past, let it go. Don't even remember it. A certain man caught a bird in a trap. The bird said, Sir, you have eaten many cows and sheep in your life, and you're still hungry. The little bit of meat on my bones won't satisfy you either. If you let me go, I'll give you three pieces of wisdom. One I'll say standing on your hand, one on your roof, and one I'll speak from the limb of that tree. The man was interested. He freed the bird and let it stand on his hand. Number one. Do not believe in absurdity, no matter who says it. The bird flew and lit on the man through. Number two. Do not grieve over what is past. It's over. Never regret what has happened. By the way, the bird continued, in my body there's a huge pearl weighing as much as 10 copper coins. It was meant to be the inheritance of you and your children, but now you've lost it. You could have owned the largest pearl in existence, but evidently it was not meant to be. The man started wailing like a woman in childbirth. The bird, didn't I just say, don't grieve for what's in the past. 
And also, don't believe in absurdity. My entire body doesn't weigh as much as 10 copper coins. How could I have a pearl that heavy inside me? The man came to his senses. All right, tell me number three. Yes, you've made such good use of the first two. 196. Don't give advice to someone who's groggy and falling asleep. Don't throw seeds on the sand. Some torn places cannot be packed. Back to the second fish. The half-intelligent one. He mourns the absence of his guide for a while, and then thinks, what can I do to save myself from these men and their nets? Perhaps if I pretend to be already dead, I'll belly up on the surface and float like waves float, just giving myself totally to the water. To die before I die, as Muhammad said to. So he did that. He bobbed up and down, helpless, within arm's reach of the fisherman. Look at this, the best and biggest fish is dead. One of the men lifted him by the tail, spat on him, and threw him up on the ground. He rolled over and over and slid secretly near the water, and then, back in. Meanwhile, the third fish, the dumb one, was agitatedly jumping about, trying to escape with his agility and cleverness. The net, of course, finally closed around him, and as he lay in the terrible frying pan bed, he thought, if I get out of this, I'll never live again in the limits of a lake. Next time, the ocean, I'll make the infinite my home. 9 to 7. Send the chaperones away. Inside me a hundred beings are putting their fingers to their lips and saying, that's enough for now. Shish. Silence is an ocean. Speech is a river. When the ocean is searching for you, don't walk to the language river. Listen to the ocean, and bring your talky business to an end. Traditional words are just babbling in that presence, and babbling is a substitute for sight. When you sit down beside your beloved, send the chaperones away, the old women who brought you together. When you are mature and with your love, the love letters and matchmakers seem irritating. You might read those letters, but only to teach beginners about love. One who sees grows silent. When you're with one of those, be still and quiet, unless he asks you to talk. Then draw the words out as I do this poem with Hassani, the radiance of God. I try to stop talking, but he makes me continue. Usam, if you are in the vision, why do you want me to say words? Maybe it's like the poet Abu Mu'ad, who said in Arabic, Pour me some wine, and talk to me about the wine. The cup is at my mouth, but my ear interrupts. I want some. Oh here, what you get is the heat. You turn red with this wine. But the ear says, I want more than that. When I remember your love, I weep, and when I hear people talking of you, something in my chest, where nothing much happens now, moves as in sleep. All our lives we've looked into each other's faces. That was the case today too. How do we keep our love secret? We speak from brow to brow and hear with our eyes. The gift of water. Someone who doesn't know the Tigris River exists brings the caliph who lives near the river a jar of fresh water. The caliph accepts, thanks him, and gives in return a jar filled with gold coins. Since this man has come through the desert, he should return by water. Taken out by another door, the man steps into a waiting boat. 
99 and sees the wide fresh water of the Tigris. He bows his head, what wonderful kindness that he took my gift. Every object and being in the universe is a jar overfilled with wisdom and